these are just three examples of very famous Catholic uh, monastics who were very open about their um, attraction to Hindu and Buddhist teachings and how it has transformed their own Christianity and their own relationship to God and their own way they understand their own tradition and practice their own tradition. There are Jews similarly, rabbis. I have a friend who's an Advaita rabbi. He's an initiate in the Ramakrishna order, but, and he's a rabbi. And this phenomenon of Americans reevaluating their own religious tradition in the light of what they've learned about spirituality from Vedanta and yoga and gurus is a very important development and I, I suspect <clears throat> it's going to change the nature of uh, the dominant religion, Western religions over time. You could see it already happening in, in the West, it's uh, in America. I won't go into detail, but it's, it's fascinating. And one of the reasons for that is the universality of Sanatana Dharma. The gurus who came right from the beginning with Vivekananda, no one ever said to Americans, you should convert and become a Hindu. It was just not, it was, it was unthinkable. It was not part of the mission. It was not part of the, the job description. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, I mean, Vivekananda <clears throat> was explicit about that, you know, and so was every other guru who came. You know, I'm not asking you to be a Hindu. I'm teaching you something. These are universal teachings. You can apply them to your life, whether you're a Christian or a Jew. I hope to make, they'll make you a better Christian or a better Jew or a better Muslim. Or, and if you're an atheist and you don't have any interest in religion, these can be applied to a secular way of life. You can understand this as a science of being, a science of consciousness, <clears throat> ways to live a happier, more fulfilled life, and just think of them in secular or scientific terms. And that's what happened. People in America said, they applied it to their own way of life. If they wanted better health, then yoga was a health practice. If they wanted enlightenment, then the teachings were spiritual teachings. If they wanted uh, to have a, a clearer mind, then they were silencing their mind with yoga. They were versatile teachings and still are, and they've been applied in this kind of um, universal way. But I want to single out one source of transmission because A, it's fun, and B, it was so real, so very important. When Ravi Shankar came to the West in 1956, he was embraced by classical music fans who found some value in Indian classical music. Then certain jazz artists became uh, enamored by Indian music and many of them became yogis. And John Coltrane became a great you know, yoga practitioner, meditator, and his wife, after he died, became a swami and had her own ashram. But then <clears throat> there was this meeting of uh, Indian music and rock and roll and when George Harrison of the Beatles discovered the sitar, I'm getting head nods from people of a certain age. <laughs> the young people may not, younger people may not remember. But when, when George discovered the sitar, he said, oh, I love this sound, I want to know more. So being one of the four most famous entertainers on the planet, he was able to get the best teacher possible and he went to Ravi Shankar and Ravi Shankar said, come to India and I'll teach you the sitar. But one of the great things about Ravi Shankar was he recognized that one, when he became famous in the West, he was not just a, a musician, he was an exponent of Sanatana Dharma and he understood the, um, that 
the, the, the deep spiritual underpinnings of the classical music should be explained and people should appreciate it. And he recognized in George Harrison a serious seeker of truth who was discontent with, Amer with religious teachings and the hippie scene and the drug scene and, and he was ripe. And he, so he gave him Vivekananda's Raj Yoga to read and Yogananda's autobiography and George's life changed. And he became a serious proponent of Hindu Dharma the rest of his life, a dedicated meditator and Krishna Bhakta. And he started to think, well, all these books say I should have a meditation practice, so at the first opportunity I'm going to try to learn one. And the opportunity came in August of 1967, <clears throat> when Maharshi Mahesh Yogi was lecturing in London, he had just started to get a little fame among young people, and the Beatles went to meet him. And that meeting changed the world. It was the, the, the relationship of East and West exploded in the public mind at that time. It's like the earth tilted. So all the Sanatana Dharma can now flow to the West more freely because the, the Beatles opened the floodgates. It was unbelievable. I went back to read the newspaper and magazine coverage of those, not only when they met and they learned his transcendental meditation, but a few months later when they actually went to India to Rishikesh to be in his ashram, which was really a remarkable thing at that time, that the most famous and richest four young men in the planet would choose to spend their time sitting in meditation in an ashram on the Ganges when they could be in the most luxurious places on earth, right? This was news, big news. That was when most people in the West, Western world heard the word mantra for the first time and the word guru and the word ashram and there was something and, and little other concepts started filtering in like karma. But mostly it was evidence that the yogic tradition from this country nobody thought had value to the West, that there was something there that might be of value. <clears throat> because millions of young people at that time would do anything the Beatles did, for better and for worse, the Beatles were meditating, they wanted to do it. And, and part of that was people like John Lennon saying, oh, I used to do LSD, now I meditate. And many, many people said, oh, I want to try that too. And all of a sudden, meditation exploded. And with it, interest in all the other gurus who were around, interest in Yogananda, interest in the Vedanta Society, interest in Hatha Yoga teachers, the whole thing exploded. That's why all those gurus I showed you became famous. But one of the primary effects of this was when people, young people took up these practices, they changed. Their minds, their bodies, their, their emotions, everything got bet a little better. And the adult segment of the population took notice. And scientists said, what's going on here? Is this just a massive placebo effect or is there something real? And that was the beginning of the scientific research into meditation and yogic practices. I was a subject of one of those. I took up meditation at that time. I was living in Cambridge. <clears throat> Somebody at Harvard Medical School was, wanted to study meditation. He asked for volunteers. So I sat with a blood pressure cuff and electrodes coming out of my head, and I was a data point in a study that got published in a major magazine, uh, not magazine, scientific journal, and that led to other scientific journals because, oh my goodness, look, you, you do this ancient practice with Sanskrit mantras and, and your blood pressure lowers and your brain waves change and 
There's implications in this for health and well-being. And that started the enterprise of those scientific research. The end result was that all the aspects of Sanatana Dharma, not just meditation, but all the other yogic practices and the ideas behind them, the, 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 the core philosophy, started to be taken seriously. And within a few years, instead of meditation being something rock musicians and hippies did, you had Clint Eastwood on television talking about how he meditates and how it's helped his life. And now you have Oprah Winfrey you know, being the face of meditation. And that, that was the mainstreaming of the uh, of yoga practices like meditation, but also just the legitimization of the whole of Sanatana Dharma that then would get adapted by all these different people and spread throughout the culture leading to these effects I mentioned. And, the, and, the, and it took on different forms because you know how diverse the set of teachings are and different aspects of it somehow caught on at different times. And then within the last 20 years you had the, the Hatha Yoga boom where um, there's you know yoga studios on every street corner practically in the West, we, and there's a downside to this because now in you, we have the uh, the danger that yoga has become synonymous with physical fitness and just asana practice, and you know but I'm confident because there's a lot of people concerned about that 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 the fullness of what yoga is will not be lost in this wild commercialization of, of yoga as a physical fitness modality. Um, and you'll, it just as another example that of, of things that couldn't be predicted, back when I first was drawn to these teachings in the, in the old, you know, hippie days of the late 60s, ISKCON became visible when Srila Prabhupada came and people were, and that was our only exposure to kirtan, was the, the Krishnas who would be prancing through the streets and the parties every once in a while, and, and most Americans thought they were just wacky and you know, didn't take them seriously. Well, over time, people started to understand that this was part of a, 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 a tradition of bhakti, the word bhakti became known, and that you know that's a form of bhakti that's widely practiced, and 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 things changed. And now, kirtan is incredibly popular in America, especially among young yoga practitioners. There are kirtan festivals that draw thousands of people. I went to one because I was speaking um, in September out in the desert, this four-day festival of kirtan and yoga classes and occasional discourses by you know, scholars or reporters like me. There were 3,000 people there. Just kirtan celebration. And, and, and it's this interesting east-west mix because there's very, uh, there are now kirtan wallas who are very famous and making money, you know, in concert halls. 10, 20 years ago, those same people were just, you know, doing kirtan with their little sangha, you know, doing 10 people. And now they're, you know, they, they sell out, you know, uh, auditoriums. And, but they're, the ones who are most famous are true to the use of mantra. They don't mess with that. They understand the value of the Sanskrit and that. But they'll change the musicality. They'll bring in Western rhythms, Western musicians, you know, electric bass, whatever it is. And this is a serious developing art form and spiritual practice now in America. It's a phenomenal thing. There's even a hip hop uh, people doing hip hop piranhas, and you know, it's 
And now, now there's another development, and I just want to sort of highlight this. This is, this is just outside LA. There are mandirs all around the country because uh, the, one of the new f sources of transmission of Sanatana Dharma are people like you who've moved to America. We have Hindu Americans. Miss America is a Hindu. The last six winner, <laughs> the last six winners of the National Spelling Bee contest, young young boys and girls of Indian origin, born in America. People now, uh, their their understanding of what the Hindu Dharma is changes because, you know, maybe their doctor is named Patel or, you know, their kid goes to class and comes home with Joey and Shirley and Ravi, you know, and, and this is American life and they learn things that overcome you know, centuries of misinformation and misconception just because, you know, their coworker is a Hindu and they say, what, 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 what is this Duvali? What is that? What, is, what, what are all these gods? Do you really worship monkeys? You know, and, and minds are changed and attitudes change because, you know, Americas are open. And, and in that way, uh, more people become familiar with with the Hindu Dharma, and uh, relations change. And sometimes the people change their own ideas about spirituality and and so forth. And as time goes by, some of those Hindu uh, immigrants will.